how I, these I already work. did two, most of them, but I'm oh, going okay. to do it again. Okay. Uh, Including me. Yes. <laughs> do you, uh, excuse me, do you need an explanation of how to uh, work the headsets? It's quite simple. So, so I mean, what we have to do is plug it in here. It's already on channel one, and all you have to do is turn it on, and that's going to be your volume. Okay, right here. Okay. 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 I'll put this okay. here and, and, um, and make sure that you can hear me. Uh, are you uh, are you already set up? Yes, I'm already set up here. So, can you hear me? One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Is that good enough? You yeah. Can, if it's too loud or louder, louder. Is that too loud? How's that? Is that good? You can just turn it up. That, up and down. Okay. Okay. I have a microphone. Hello, how are you? in your ear.
Hello? I'm trying now? Yes? Okay. So we just keep it like, I must, that little, okay. Do you want me to just to just keep it like that, T not yeah. touch it? Okay. All right. Seguimos, sí. Good afternoon again. And, uh, and thank you for being here and for being interested in this topic. And I'd like to get started by saying, um, talking to you very simply and quickly, uh, tell you who we are. And uh, both Mariano and myself, he's going to talk about his track record. And I will tell you about mine. <clears throat> and we've been working for about 25 years in the art world and a commissioner of exhibits and also as an art critic. And in the last 10 years, I was in charge of, uh, of a magazine called De Contexto, which is uh, a magazine that is a publication for art and culture and uh, talks about national politics and all kinds of international uh, artistic productions. And we, there are three uh, commissioners and we are colleagues and we like to, uh, we are friends nonetheless. <laughs> Even though we, uh, we share ideas and sometimes we don't agree, sometimes we disagree, we argue very, very strenuously, vehemently, but uh, our discussions and our arguments are very fruitful about art, the art world and ideas that we're interested in. And all these years in different projects, as we work together, we have uh, become richer from our joint efforts. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mariano Navarro, and I started working as a consultant of contemporary art on the Spanish television in the 70s, in mid-70s, I would say, last century, of course, when it was black and white TV. And uh, my work until today has been uh, centered around uh, mostly the artists with whom I've shared my life, Spanish artists who lived in that decade in the 70s, the transition between the dictatorship, Franco's dictatorship, to to the beginning of the democracy. And they are my friends, my generation, people that I learned a lot from. And uh, they just gave me a great deal. And I have developed um, in the uh, in publications, literary, philosophical areas. And I've worked basically my with my generation, especially dealing with Spain at that time, we worked in, on the international level, especially in Latin America, where I was fortunate enough, to, I was fortunate to work for the his centenary of Salvador Allende in Chile. I was the curator for the exhibit. And, uh, and I write a critical piece in El Mundo. I have a, a weekly critic, and I work with Alicia Murillas magazine. And our first exhibit was done between, but we did it today again in 92. She and I put it together on public spaces and private spaces. In other words, the contemporary artists and how they took over public space and private space. But that's all. And that's all. That's all I have to say for now. As a segue to his introduction, 
We started thinking about this exhibit in 2008, towards the end of 2008. And to be fair, it was had a strange birth. A Spanish museum made a proposal to Mariano to uh, do a project in his uh, in his site in his facilities, and Mariano didn't. He thought it would be a good idea to invite Juan Antonio and I in the share project, and we accepted. And this was a very generous offer, and we started that way. And then that museum, of course, did not have any money. And we were orphaned with a beautiful project without a space or to where it could occur, where it take place. During that time, that uh, interim, the Andalusian Center of Contemporary Art uh, had a uh, open the director's uh, position, and our friend owned that place. And he started to design his project, his ex exhibits, and he thought that this would be a very interesting exhibit for him. So it was ideal. Everything was just uh, hunky dory, and this was a project that we. This was a, an orphan project, a project that had started all of a sudden, could take place and could happen right there. And uh, how did we broach this uh, topic? Well, I talked about it yesterday, and I want to talk about it again. At no point did we want to illustrate uh, our preconceived ideas. We didn't want to show preconceived ideas. Of course, our analysis was political analysis. It was a shared analysis, ideological. And the current events that we're living right now. But what we wanted was to find a way for artists to interpret not so much the moment of the crisis, the, but also the last decades, how the world was living the, the last few years, and how they could translate symbolically all the political processes, thought processes, uh, everything that was uh, causing a transformation worldwide, and in fact, has done so and made it worse. So we we talked about collapses. We talked about the collapse of communism, the downfall of communism, and we also talked about geopolitical collapses, and also the collapse of capitalism, and. But today, Mariano and I were talking during lunch that Juan Antonio and I differed when we talked up when we talked about capitalism, the collapse of capitalism, because Juan Antonio thought that already in 2008, capitalism was uh, beginning to fall apart. And I thought that uh, capitalism needed the small crisis in order to clean itself up, become healthier, and keep on going. So that was a disagreement that we both faced, but we continue. Each one of us is, we continue thinking our own thoughts. We believe our own beliefs. We talk about the collapse of democracy, which is being pulled, dragged through the mud by the economic situation. And I mean that because citizens, civil society is uh, has fewer and fewer lesser participation in its uh, their efforts really come to nothing it's because there is so many speculation uh, so much speculation in the, in the marketplace so citizens don't really have a way to democratically participate and they cannot stop or be able to disagree against uh, certain political uh, forces. So I don't know if Mariano uh, wants to talk with me, and maybe the two of us can discuss 
if things, but if you want to stop us and ask questions, uh, give us feedback, uh, you can ask us anything you want. As Alicia said, everything started thanks to a very generous, generous idea. The truth is that when I was working with the uh, Spanish Museum and thinking about a huge exhibit and a, a very relevant political topic, I thought my own experience would not be enough uh, to face the difficulties that were beginning to uh, to appear in Spanish society. So, so maybe selflessly, I decided to ask uh, two people who had the knowledge and uh, they were they complemented mine in some ways, and that allowed us to, uh, because Alicia Murria's uh, magazine, uh, her, this is a, this is a small commercial here, because her magazine allowed us from 2003 2008 everything that interested us and that drove our thinking, had been a driver, to, in other words. Uh, also, Juan Antonio's international uh, experience helped us and allowed us to travel to the most important places where everything was happening. And we had direct contact with with the works of art. We, we didn't have to work with metaphors or uh, it, we could actually see the works and in depth so we were able to we were able to analyze what he brought us from his international experience and then and my non-existent uh, share you know we were able to get a very useful program and uh, like Alicia said we we reached several conclusions first of all the preamble of the exhibit or one of the strong points the chapter that we called we had the same title as the great book of poetry by Antonio Camonida. Uh, this is description of lies. And, uh, and this enabled us to look at reality uh, through what was given to us by the media, the narrative uh, uh, from different parts of the world. And that gave us like an, a strong basis to build the exhibit because without knowing what reality is, you cannot think about utopia. Uh, and uh, the description of lie allowed us to create a very slippery and ambiguous uh, surface of different societies when they try to set up this reality. And I'm going to give you a very quick example. Uh, Lennenberg's piece, Lennenberg's piece, which is part of the exhibit, the Lennenberg, I think it is called Gentleman and Encounter. <laughs> Encounter. It's a. That's it. <laughs> This piece places us before all the contradictions that we could be facing. On the one hand, you have like a moral basis 
regarding what the Europeans thinking was about a proper marriage between uh, leadership uh, magazines, books, and the ex an expansion of freedom. And uh, people like uh, Beauvoir and Sartre were able to use that. Those, those great writers had their they, 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 they had a North American antagonism or posture and at a given at a given moment and also other historical uh, and then uh, this was it was like a CIA uh, venture uh, with interventionism and then there was how how in Europe, how the, every state, every European state has been part of spreading culture and uh, in the relationship with uh, in with the intellectuals. At at which point we could say something negative, because the United States was offering a cultural vantage point view, uh, which was coming pretty much it was an idea that was against uh, communism. One idea was that this was very good and it was also very important in order to preserve freedom. And it was a little bit ambiguous, but it were no moral judgment as there were before. This is how we thought that we would we would build the entire work of the exhibition. Then we chose different works from different artists, uh, the various periods, aspects that we went to analyze, and and then we decided to we f we found a magazine called Multitudes which was during the year of the crisis. And then we tried to to utilize their vocabulary, to use an ex do an exhibit and to have a catalog with them. And so that the, we added to their texts, we created new texts. Yes, a little bit slow. Yeah, un poquito más despacio. Yeah, yeah. And then, so that we have a theoretical corpus that it was not our own, but also a much more productive and a larger kind of production. And we wanted to generate other people's thinkings, and we wanted to provide other conclusions that were not part and parcel of our setup, of our theoretical setup. And we, we saw that this was brought to a happy ending, let's say, when it went from Seville to the Yerba Buena Center, you know, as far as we've gone in San Francisco because thanks to our friend here, uh, the extraordinary work done by our team, the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, the uh, debate, the discussions that we had with Patrick on different places and different things that we decided on how to place the pieces. We had a new vision about this exhibit. So, we saw one of the most important pieces for this exhibit. So the, the let's say, prehistoric from, from the 80s to the 90s in the Soviet Union. And then what did it mean when the communist bloc disappeared? What does it mean for the greediness of capitalism? We have to think about that. That's something to think of. And the next two rooms, we had organized chapters. Uh, and uh, Patty and Eri, excuse me, I'm sorry, Patrick and you offered an alternative, a different kind of alternative. The pieces from different charm were interchangeable. They, ex rather, they exchanged 
topics, arguments. So on the one hand, the description of a lie, Chile in a particular time, they give us the idea that they could talk about financial and economic functioning systems or of different kinds. Or for instance, certain types of criticism should be placed in a different way. So we were offering a different vision of, uh, of arguments, of presentations that took place at the time. So Because there's a certain amount of We had so many exchanges and changes in category gave us a greater symbolic presentation instead of a file, because only one file wouldn't have allowed us to see all of that. So this overlap it, it was a much better way to do it. So it's fantastic to see this exhibition, which has already been around for a lot of time, some years. And uh, decisions had to be taken because we didn't have enough room for all the pieces. But we didn't distort it. We actually expanded on its meaning. And unfortunately, we we would have liked to we would like to think that the crisis was part of the past instead of something current. Yo 
volveré a un capítulo al que fue el que quizás dediqué más empeño, que es el capítulo que hemos titulado Descripción de la mentira. I'll go back to a chapter that I was talking about, which is really important, is the description of the lie. En el que and, and we we looked at a number of artists who had worked on, on how the media modify reality and shape it in order to show it to the public. And so you have pieces such as uh, like Ignacia Ballin, Ignacia Abayi has this piece which is very simple and it shows the development throughout a year and the artist compiles all a daily a daily copy of El País we're talking about which is a very well-known newspaper and she clips the names of n countries that appear on different pages, international and national politics, sports, culture, etc. And afterwards, she places these words and she files them until at the end of the year, she alphabetizes them uh, according to the number of times that they appear, and, and they, then they choose a different uh, letter type, a type, according to the importance of the piece of news. And at the end, we have a map of the interests of the media when they talk about so-called reality of, of the world, like in 2010, and this is what this uh, piece, a country that normally would never appear in the world. Greece, all of a sudden, Greece appeared as often as Russia or the United States or or the, 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 the countries which have a great bearing hegemonies because the crisis had literally destroyed uh, Greek reality. But this simplicity, you have places like Yugoslavia, Azerbaijan, or other countries, African countries, they never mention, they never appear on the press. They don't exist as far as they're concerned. Like, for instance, Congo four or five times. And if you look for the references, they are, oh, because of the killings, the murders, massacres, and then all of a sudden they just kind of appear from time to time. And so the very simplicity of the process allows you to become aware of what we think of the world. What was also interesting to us was the narrative to create a non-existent reality. For instance, Gilbert Kane, Judy Bertheim, I don't remember the name of this right now. It's called The Community. Oh, Dignity was the name of the community, supposedly started in Chile at the end of the Second World War. And it was allegedly created by German immigrants, but in reality, they, they were Nazis, really. And they were Nazi leaders who fled and lived in Chile. And so they created a second society under the aegis of the Chilean government of the time, and they created their own security forces, their own farms, and they had their own production systems, their own schools, and they were always shown as dignity, dignity of work, effort, reality, when in reality it was it was Nazi ideology that was being featured inside Chile. So it is not 
odd that these colonies gave rise to the repressive body in the assault guards and military groups of General Pinochet that ruled the country until the, his death, pretty much. And then, uh, then we have uh, Laura Garcia, Dora Garcia, excuse me. This is fear the fear of being spied upon, where you think that 60% of the of the citizenships uh, cooperated with the police. And so we discovered also that besides all the political regimes, the idea of control of the warping manipulation of people's conscience is it's left this very strong authoritarian ideas, even if they think that democratic societies, but they continue to be authoritarian. <laughs> In my opinion, typically the artist uh, acts out of two different positions, like in Dora Garcia. It seems like it's an objective glance on reality and builds a narrative which replaced the fictitious narrative of told by the competent authorities, in other words, the official story. In uh, what the Judy shows us the images of Chile at the time, and it sets it up against her narrative to denounce, to talk about what was really going on in Chile. Or, for instance, uh, in, uh, in Lenneberg, the narrative has two perspectives. Number one, it tells us like daily life, fascinating life of a, I don't remember the couple's name. It, and and they tell us their, their voyages, their trips through Europe, Venice, Spain, as if we're like a very cool, pleasant people. And it's juxtaposed with the, with the interview that took place in 2003, which really talks about uh, the, the truth. So, so, so in, she interrupts, she disturbs the narrative in order to actually show what was behind all this. I'd like to mention a few uh, works, a few pieces that I'm very interested in. I'm interested in all of them, but uh, there are a few that I find uh, particularly appealing and they move me deeply. One of them is this uh, Alfredo Yas piece. Where is it? Where is it? It's not there. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it's a video piece. And the title is the Pasolini's Ashes. And with uh, documentary material from interviews and uh, from all kinds of programs, TV programs, and, uh, and uh, of course, it was done from the 50s till the 80s until 
Pasolini's death, when he was assassinated, when he was murdered. And he's one of the, the great ability. But, you know, he was, he was extraordinary because he had a lot of impact in politics. He was a great critic, Paolo Pasolini. Besides, he was a great uh, film director, but as a, he was a critical voice in his country, a critical conscious, and as a matter of fact, it's, he talks as if we were talking about today's uh, Italy. He talks about, for instance, the uh, terrible, terrible role played by television and how it's lower the levels, the standards, the weakening of culture, school system, and how it's going to create a, or a, a, a people without any education, very malleable. And then, of course, afterwards, how he was killed and that cloak of uh, it was like the sexual innuendo, the fact that he was gay and that he, no, we never knew, we never found out what happened, but some analysts really posit the fact that he was uh, assassinated. It was an assassination political because he was a very uncomfortable and disturbing voice for the powers that be. So. And he organizes the material. He just selects it in such a way that you get a critical flavor voice, and it's very current. And next to him, we have El Roto, El Roto, up there. There, there it is. Yeah. He's not a Vandalic artist. I mean, what I mean is that. El roto. What we what we chose were his cartoons, his his vignettes, his cartoons, which he has in El País every day, and become. No, please, please, please leave the wow, the other one. But look at this image. It's not in this exhibit, but this is. This is paper. You can see one of these little bulbs, so those rafts. These are the rafts that people from Africa take in order to uh, Spain. And all you can see is you can see their continent. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a raft, but you see uh, Africa up, upside down. And so it's like when you open the newspaper in the morning or read uh, something on internet, and you, his topics, his analysis are really chilling. He is humorous, he is ironic. And then I'm going to talk about uh, the other thing. Yes. What Alicia said and insinue, your answer how does an artist face different situations? We see how they use sarcasm or black humor to define current situations. Situation, excuse me. For instance, three things. Carlos Mota was one of them. Severica. Oh, oh, Jan Peter Hammer, he has a video based on Fernando Pessoa's uh, piece, and he, he, he transformed a, 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 a theater piece, a play, into a talk show, a journalist interviewing a banker who defends neoliberalism to the bitter end. And he does it with so arrogantly, so self-assured. This anarchical banker, he starts, he destroys all our social layers, which we think are really part and parcel of society. It's, it's chilling, it's horrific. And I remember when the banker tells the interviewer, look, in life you have, you, you have to have your priorities. 
if if my industry generates work and and and, and contaminates rivers, well, move the rivers. But my business has to keep uh, keep on. Another one is. Uh, Superflex, this is another, this is a collective, and he faces us in front of a uh, dictator who hypnotizes us, mesmerizes us, and tells us that crisis is very good for people's development, and that once we have overcome these hard times, we'll get to greater paradise, more beautiful paradise, and everything that is happening is good for society. And there is that, that element of sarcasm that, that the only way we can believe that is if we're mesmerized, we're hypnotized. And there he is, he wakes us up at the end, snapping his fingers. Let's talk about El Roto his vignettes and his uh, work on the press. It, there is a vignette that he published a while back. He, he asks a question. There are two people talking to men, and he says, do you know what communism is good for? One of them asks, and the other says, sure. So that, the, so that the working class could live a bit better. So communism was no good for them. But the fear of communism for the rest of the world caused workers to have a breather, to have certain advantages which they wouldn't have otherwise with this ochre, which was so fearsome. And I was telling Mariano something today. I was saying that uh, the uh, convulsions of capitalism that our colleague uh, calls collapses, you know, collapsing capitalism, or if capitalism is going to commit suicide, I think capitalism wild capitalism, savage capitalism, can take us not so much to uh, committing suicide, but the, our death, which is something entirely different. Our, I think that capitalism, in some way, is parallel to nature. There's a parallelism to nature, because nature has uh, just relentless processes, of course, you know, and species uh, disappear, and capitalism, in in a similar way, does that. If um, if you if you can't you if you make make it on your own. You might as well die. You have to be efficient. You have to be productive. If you are sick, if you don't adapt to the rhythm, the majority, whatever they want us to do, the way you want us to work, if you do not adapt, you're out of the system. And if you're not outside, if you're not in, you're going to you're going to have a very bad time. So people who consume, who are productive, who don't think very much. Who, uh, who work within a very, very specific uh, framework. I'd like to show you another artist, Carlos Mota. Carlos Mota, we have this beautiful photograph. Is This was filmed in Buenos Aires. Excuse me, this was taken in Buenos Aires. It's a little has a few years, this was about six years ago. And it says, I like it when you vote because you look like you're far away. It's like, uh, this is a paraphrase to Neruda's poetry. I like it when you're quiet because you seem far away, because you look absent. Because it is true, because when you vote, you're far away, you're absent. 
And so I think the use of humor is very clear. Argentinian people are, they have a very sharp sense of humor. We can show you a few others. He takes images from different parts of Latin America. I'd like you to take a look at Carlos Mota's webpage because this is this is tiny, tiny bit of his huge corpus of work on Latin America, the colonization of vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the United States, of course, how it's colonized at different generations. And uh, it's very interesting. We could only bring you a few. I like to, I think I'll be done after I tell you about this artist. And, and this is Daniel Garcia Trujas from Spain. He's not there. Oh my God. It's on, is it the first, the small? It's right in the corner. Yes, is it where the, f the fruit, the leaves, there are images from uh, the media, advertising, communication, uh, political events. And uh, it's, uh, the time frame is from uh, from before the fall of the wall of Berlin Wall to November the 8th till 18, from 89. I think it was on the 8th. The fall was on the 8th. And then this September the 10th, 2001, right, the day, the day before, the Twin Towers. So it's that images from uh, and of course, he banalizes serious uh, things. He, anything, anything serious was uh, destroyed. Uh, the commercials, uh, everything, just kind of destroyed and turned everything upside down. This, this is what we live during those years. Eleven years, or is it eleven years? 20 years, I should say, and uh, as if uh, how this two facts, two events changed geopolitics totally and completely. Our universe was uh, became topsy-turvy. And since you were talking about something frivolous or something superficial, so this is how uh, a, uh, the world can change in this one day. This was a, a this was a slogan and ad in 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 Brazil. This it said the world can change in one single day. So entirely things uh, arbitrary concept that uh, that they were summed up in one image. If you have any questions right now, And what I find really uh, moving about the exhibition is the exhibition 
when someone um, also someone opens up your own question where there is no easy answer. That there is yeah. no particular yeah. answer. May I ask you a question? What is capitalism? <laughs> May I ask you a question? What is democracy? OK, I ask myself, what is capitalism? I don't know. What is democracy? I don't know. I want to tell you that. Cut Sandra's pieces and and no, not Lesler. Isminski. <laughs> Ressler. They show us the way that we have very clear knowledge of some things and we totally ignore, we do not know the true substance of all this, and we continue to haunt our awareness, our consciousness of all these things. And in the United States, there was it, it, who, who, who still, you know, we just had this film, Lincoln, it was uh, just opened. Which country, which country, who, who could who could say that uh, the democracy is the, is government for the people by the people and for the people who right now we have the dictatorship of uh, uh, financial elites over the most unprotective and uh, abandoned uh, social classes we're facing situations that are extraordinarily dangerous for real democracy they pose a risk to democracy. And what I think is fascinating about this artist is that they face us before these realities with images, with narratives, with symbolism, and their very immediate expressions with uh, Katia Sander, very, very simple, Katia Sander. And again, this, this area is just a whole bunch of mirrors. And, and they, she shows us these incredible horizons in the United States, these incredible vistas where you could find all the potential development of, of capitalism. And you ask people, would well, you know where this is? Do you know? Do you know where you are? Do you know what you're looking at? And, uh, and Ressler says, it's Ressler, it uh, shows this with a very valid image because he says that everything is, people cannot burn their flag. So in order to recover democracy, one of the first things that we need to do is we, we have to get rid of this idea that we're separate countries and that, the, and the, you know, this, it, it, democracy has to be internationalized. In, it's internationalized, excuse me. We have to we have to forget about the idea that one country is more democratic than the other because each nation hides within itself the undermining elements of democracy. And they face sociologists, intellectuals and philosophers from different countries and this is, we asked them, and they, he asked them to burn all flags, everybody's flag, every single country. So you only have the narrative, the country, of the country, the, the thought, the thought itself, no flags. England, Finland, United States, uh, Sweden, different countries, not just not just the American flag, no, just flags of different countries. Is the generic thought of uh, a flag? In other words, no, we're not attacking any particular country. It's the concept of flags. It's just you know. Wrestler is. As a matter of fact, he's an American wrestler. Mm. Um, so, how does Utopia fit into this policy? All oh. this discussion and all of these paradigms that we've been kind of dancing about. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what about a Utopia?
possible for us to have the desire for a utopia under these conditions? May I ask a question? <laughs> what is utopia? Thomas More. Well, from Thomas More, maybe we have specialists right now. Exactly, you're so right. Spot on. We are like the three happy curators because we work together and then very, very naive. Because in 2008, when we started working in with uh, reality and utopia, uh, without reality, there is utopia, we thought that in 2011, we could have the second exhibit. And, uh, and, uh, and this is 2013, and, and we never got to any of those places that we aim to get. Yes, we are in the midst of analyzing, maybe, that two ingredients that may transform our society. On the one hand, new social movements that have emerged in the last few years. And, uh, and thanks to the social networks, uh, and of course, very different from what we used to have. There is no monopoly, no more informational monopoly. We don't have a media monopoly that uh, used to be completely autonomous or very close to it. We have social movements that want to go deeply into what it is, what is real democracy. There are still, uh, there are still very basic, very much at the onset. The media, the governments have uh, been chastised them as if they were subversive anti-system, as the system had been able to prove that it was superior, and they don't know what right they have to say that over other citizens. The uh, angry people moments, Los Indignados, has been very, very powerful. It has a lot of strength. And in fact, it gave uh, rise to other movements in other countries. And, and a lot of hope. Uh, there is a lot of hope in that moment. And why? Why do we have this moment? It's because traditional conventional political parties, unions, are incapable, impotent, because they are part of the so-called democratic machinery. Um, yes, uh, in name only, this formal democracy, that they have no, they have no basis in reality and they have no potential to transform the country. The Illuminados are young people, and they are very people without very little political experience. They don't come from the political parties, the unions, and they're a hope. They represent a hope because they are giving rise to new processes, and we don't know how they're going to evolve. They are important, of course, because they're telling us that youth is, or young people, they, they, they don't, they're not interested in traditional politics. They talk about democracy, like so many of us think. It, we think that it's not a closed or stable process. It's not at all that way. Democracy is always expanding, always going deeper, always questioning itself, uh, readapting, changing, or it's not real democracy. Uh, otherwise, it's not useful. 
because there are new needs emerging. So democracy should be and is participation, uh, uh, constant construction of a country. Um, Nobody is talking about perfection, utopia, sometime in the future, like the Greek idea, because because we've always thought of it as we're, we're letting something go, we're putting it in the back burner for some future time. And what we need to do is create changes, make changes, set something up that is useful for us right now. And we can't keep putting off something because we'll all be dead and buried. And so for us, it has been, it's been like a, a breath of fresh air, something that has been very exciting for us. I'm part of movement, I'm part of the Ocupados on Madrid, and uh, I'm sorry, I'm part of the, I got confused with the Occupy with Indignados. Uh, it's not that you have uh, just an occasional demonstration, it's, uh, it's things change every day, and then there are people in front, in for instance, in my in my neighborhood, there are people talking about neighborhood problems on a Sunday morning and uh, things that I had never heard of, and I don't even know these people. And in another corner of the city, in a small coffee shop, there are other people. They're protesting because in the local school there is no no food, no breakfast service, or they have cut back or their moms have to pick up the children uh, earlier because they have fewer school hours because people are working in a different way. We're no longer working uh, with a pyramid. Uh, we're working bottom up. It's very flexible. And for a lot of people, that translates into lack of organization. There are no leaders. Uh, and what is going to happen? Who are these people? They're just people who get together, who there is no committee, there is no pyramidal structure. They're sensitive, they're open. And it looks like it's fleeting, but it is permeating, it's filtering down into the rest of society. It's a slow process, but our country is causing it to to uh, speed it up because there's such poverty in the country that people are eager, they're angry, and it's creating these new shapes, new forms that we don't know. We don't know where they're going to go. It's okay. Uh, no, no. <clears throat> We're thinking, we're thinking, we're thinking, so this is, you know, Manuel Castel is a philosopher and he talks about not the indignados, but the ignignadas, ladies. I know that, yeah, yeah, but but they are, yeah, but they're different because occupy is occupy and indignados are indignados, you know, so. <laughs> indignados are the original one and they took over for, to the, for the occupy. Los indignados fueron los originales que le dieron, digamos, la inspiración a los ocupar, a los occupy de aquí. Mm -hmm. but, but the idea, but the idea is to call it indignadas, meaning the, instead of the occupy male, they occupy females. In other words, the angry. And of course, we don't have that problem in English because the gender thing. You know, we talk about feminine and masculine. 
because the masculine, the gender masculine is el, is always the dominier. So we have indignadas, meaning the women. You don't know what you missed. Estética, ¿no? Aesthetics, ¿verdad? Right? Yeah. ¿Qué dice? Uh -huh. so, sí, sí, la política es estética también. ¿La no, no, la primera pregunta. That was the first question, right? And there was another question? La segunda pregunta vino ahora. That was one question. Vamos por partes, ¿eh? May I answer? Lo que estaba diciendo la ironía del sarcasmo. llevando a la gente que supuestamente es de afuera. What a, what a teacher, what a professor. We need another lecture. I'd like to talk about your first topic, which is if I understood your question, whether it's art is always political, and if and if politics is becomes aesthetics, is that your question? I like uh, art is not necessarily or explicitly political. I like different, but every human gesture, no matter what, is always a political gesture. 
Sometimes we identify politics as something specific, but we are political beings, animals, and what we think and how we act, the way we move, where we move, it's a political a structure where we move. For me, politics, the term politics is not just a tiny category that has to be with news, reports, political parties. It's, uh, it's our life, our daily life. I like, I went across the street to this, this uh, beautiful place. You want to sit there and you want to cry, you want to laugh because it's very moving. I think art, art does not change society. Art is not a tool for effecting change in society, but it does change people. It does change human beings. It changes individuals. And I think it's so important that role, that role is so important because every human creation, every intelligent human creation, uh, it's uplifting, it changes us. And so uh, I'm not, know if I'm answering your question, but at least in this exhibit, <laughs> just a minute, hold on, hold on, he's telling her. I don't think in this particular exhibit in, we are trying, or that somebody is trying to use this politics or make politic politics into aesthetics or exploiting problems and making them into aesthetic statement or vice versa. Um, I notice artists do that. I hate it. This is, I'm vehement about it. I don't like it. Let me give you an example. It could be a documentary, a photo documentary, a photojournalist uh, who, who showed their child, the woman and a child after a, a tragic moment, a bombing, and she's so beautiful and she's so elegant. I, I think those terribly immoral, deeply immoral imagery, and because because it is aesthetic of horrors, it's an exploitation of human misery. Art doesn't have to do that. Uh, there, are, there's wonderful art who tr transform us, who are very different experience. And here, we wanted to talk about what is happening to us. And we needed that venue, and we needed that kind of work that bring us to this very real moment. Uh, we wanted to document some of these things. Uh, some of the tools are explicit. So now you can talk. <laughs> Your question, again. We're talking about then the relationship of art with power and money maybe the relationship the artist has with 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 the person who's asking for the work of art they, and that would be something to analyze that is a very interesting topic and uh, you can do that with the sociology of art michelangelo for instance who that he had to picasso with Gambayo, so you know a lot of people but you could find a thread, you know, between art and power, and it's not always political in terms of civil action, but it is, it does refer to topics and themes that relate to power, and that goes on independently, whether they're the, it's a socialist or a democratic society, that always goes on. Your second point or question, I think you answered it yourself. Uh, yes, it's true. Irony sometimes enjoy being in that, in its own cage, but at least you, you, you know, you know what's going on. 
be, be there's a difference between being you know be then somebody who knows and doesn't know being ignorant in your in your cage and not knowing what's going on and knowing what is going on some future societies Mm, might be able to stick, stick the arm out of the cage, or this monkey can stick the, his arm or her arm out of the cage. Mm. I hate uh, the work that Santiago Sierra has done because he puts himself in a very reproachful ethical situation because he gives himself the right to exploit human beings, other topics, human beings, and because he thinks that being an artist gives him the right to transform humiliation with a so-called uh, with a so-called aesthetic gesture. Es una, es un, no, y lo último que dices, lamentablemente. He's, he's transformed my money. He is, he's actually transformed my money from the very beginning. Somebody thought that it was very funny that he paid prostitutes with heroin. And, uh, you know, is that art? Are you kidding me? And 12,000, and he sells them for 12,000 euros per picture, per photograph, and he makes seven of the same copy, seven copies of the same thing. So. Um, and uh, I found it very interesting because religion, of course, infiltrates all of our discussions about democracy and politics. Um, and, uh, you know, the setting of the original exhibition is, of course, in a monastery of religious so I was wondering uh, what role religion played if you thought about it. Um, You're wondering, sorry, again? Um, I wondered if you thought about the role of religion. They discussed religion uh, when they were forming the exhibition. The three of us shared an idea, and one is a religious feeling or experience of each, and then the traditions as tools of power to keep people under nomination frightened, uh, controlled. They're two very different things, and uh, we have not asked ourselves. Um, and we have not, it has not been a proposal, this, uh, the, the religious topic, but I really want to set up that difference because people's beliefs, feelings are one thing, but we have not, uh, we have not really focused on that topic particularly. Far it be for me to wound anyone or hurt anybody's uh, religious beliefs, but, but we have had a dual experience. Because remember, I come from the country of the Inquisition, and as a political factor, it was a repression, a tool of repression of our ideas. And in the second place, also, the Arab countries are being smashed by a certain kind of Islamism, uh, which is 
killing that is really having an impact on civil society. So, and I don't believe in that kind of repression, but I do believe in religion and politics should be as far apart as possible. I understand that to each his own and people thinks that he belongs to religion or whatever, but I think it is an attack on personal freedom. We too, we do too, we're curious. But, I can't answer that question, why it's uh, William Burroughs reading it. He chose that text, and there is a recording, and he reads it. Yeah, he did that. And we knew Bertolt Brecht's poem, and we were very interested in this exhibit, uh, that link between uh, Brecht, Burroughs, Pasolini, there is a line of political, uh, you know, from, uh, from the post-war. And we found this in YouTube. We found, we found William Burroughs in YouTube reading Brecht, and we thought this was a magical thing. Just like uh, it was on YouTube, and then there we went on to, you know, we logged on, and here it is. And, and we tried in every way possible who, who had the rights, who had the, because, you know, since we, since, you know, since humanity, except the rest, we, we, we don't know, we have no idea. We would have liked to find out what, what is this political, political art, political link, but unfortunately, we don't know. In Sevilla, the, 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 the origin of the exhibit started from that William Barrows with his incredible chilling voice. And he talks about human beings as a beast who devours other human beings. And the end with Pasolini as an intellectual, committed intellectual, political intellectual, who, who was assassinated because he was not of murder, he was assassinated almost four years ago. And his political analysis was so pinpointed, so perfect on the reality. So we were creating this this line, this timeline between literature, poetry, artistic, visual, and uh, we thought this would be quite beautiful and very relevant. At any event, the path of the Cartuja, we, we end with the superflex and and the only way that you can do this for you is you have to be hypnotized. This is why this is such an apt image, because the rest is, you know, as the big light, you are hypnotized. Um, I'm curious about your relationship. And earlier, earlier, in the, <laughs> earlier in the, the beginning of the conversation, you mentioned disagreements that you had. One disagreement being 
And I wondered about other conceptual or curatorial disagreements that you had along the way and how they impacted the exhibit we're seeing. Y tengo curiosidad por saber qué otros desacuerdos habéis tenido cuando estabais montando la exposición que ha hecho que cambiase un poquito la forma de montar la exposición. No. No, en general no ha habido. No, en general, we haven't had that many disagreements. Uh, the, that agreement was in terms of the interpretation because it's quite notable, but in terms of the pieces, we could uh, be in favor of one versus another and negotiate which one would be the best piece uh, to, or to, small, small differences, but not many, but we haven't had that uh, many differences. We don't have that many differences in concepts. And we share. We shared the tasks. We decided to, you know, Alicia had her magazines and she looked for the. And he was looking at the task from the outside because I was, you know, tied up. So we, and then the, the third one, because he had his international experience and he released it to us and we kept integrating elements. And then, and it may seem to you like a superficial statement, but uh, we are colleagues. We have known each other for the last 15, 20 years. We argue, we discuss, we talk. So it's easier to, for us to have a big argument about food, and I'm always right about where to eat, and uh, than any other issue. Part question is either did the do you think that any of the participating artists or the curators change their political views in the course of putting the show together or in the course of putting their art together for the artists? Um, can you repeat again? So for do you think that any of the participating artists learn something or change their political views during the course of making their art? Or did you as the curators have any change of political views during the course of the making of it? Um, as far as I'm concerned, I think what happens with the work I do is that I learn and I learn from artists, from my colleagues. I'm always in the process of learning from life. But artists talk from a very, very special point of view because their production is through images, ideas. They give physical support to their ideas. And this way in which they work is very different, very peculiar, specifically for us, who, those of us who don't work with images, with objects. We don't transform reality, physical matter into anything. Artists work with resources and tools that uh, they create and imagine or reproduce a world, they reinterpret the world. And Nothing else can do something like that. I think I'm getting lost. I lost my thread. <laughs> if they learn, well, we all learn. If we changed point of views, a collective 
usually is not a it's we don't live for a long time with the artists we get to meet them then we we don't know others uh, but there is no like a, a daily exchange we don't exchange our it's just we select a work a piece it opens up worlds for you thought processes That's it. Let me answer. 27 artists think we have, 26 artists that work together. And a good number of them, Luis Espino, the coordinator, has talked to them, Juan Antonio, Alicia, and myself. And others, we see them every day. And People, we have done, we have uh, set up other kinds of exhibits, and I don't think we change anybody's uh, thought process or ideas. Maybe they saw their ideas reflected in, uh, in an ensemble that they'd never seen before. So that would have been very pleasant experience because nobody had to give up. Nobody felt uncomfortable. Nobody had to give up being part of the exhibit. I don't know if I'm answering your question. Is this an answer? I guess, um, so slightly different question. Yeah. Um, uh, well, if you don't know the artist, you wouldn't know. Like, if I've made art, um, I might start with one idea, and then the end result is completely different. Even if it's not political. But maybe if it was political, it might change my view in the course of making the art. So whether or not that happened to the artist, do you think your personal views were changed by creating the show? Did you have an enlightened change in thinking? I think we have broadened and strengthened them. We have learn more about those topics we studied. Maybe in my head, I can express better some things than when I started this project. But basically, I think I have the same ideology. However, it's become richer. But I think that what we do is, you know, is still, it changes us. And while everything is satisfying and changes us as human beings. And I was talked to, I talked to Alicia, and I like to make jokes, and then, and then we say, oh, we oh, we know a great deal about this artist, much more than we, we hadn't seen them because we see them more often than we ever did, places that we never expected him to see. I 
I'm not sure. I'm sure that I just thought of this, and maybe what I'm saying, I'm going to say something foolish, but we started with that this was a phrase by Andreas Huisen, without reality, there is no utopia. We thought we understood this sentence that we don't know that uh, if we we can think of a future world, uh, something that has a real support that we can reach sometime. But the work involved in creating this exhibit in order to find the different pieces, the different elements, we found a story, a narrative, that when you talk about reality, it has within itself the hopes of utopia, even if they were not written anywhere. What, what, what the, the exhibit has little bites here. It's here, this is what you have. This is something that you could solve this way. This you could solve this way. And it's like we have like a phantom, like a ghost of utopia. And, or a dream, more like a dream than a, than a phantom, than a ghost. Uh, It's been quite an experience to see it uh, for a second time and seen with different nuances and different uh, aspects which it didn't have the first time. But it's there's something utopian about it. From can we understand? a better world from this particular reality. We haven't left that. I think that's what I'm still thinking. That's my, my thinking. Well, thank you. This is a great place to end. Mm -hmm. yeah. On our behalf, we hope to that when we have finished what the second half, which is the exhibit, and and then they keep us asking us, and we can come back at the second half.